than 42 million Americans have served in the United States Armed Forces. Of those, fewer than 3,600 have been awarded our nation's highest military honor. And of those, only one has been a military working dog handler. Hi, Mom and Dad. I guess you thought I'd forgot about you because I haven't written, but I've been busy lately. For a while, we didn't have much to do, but now things are pretty well stirred up. We had a mortar attack yesterday. We got about 40 or 50 rounds. Bob Hope, who visited our men there as he had in two previous wars, said of them, I guess you know what kind of guys your sons and brothers and the kids next door are. Well, yes, we do know. I think we just let it slip our minds for a time. Duke got a small piece behind his ear, and we took him to Coochie to the division vet, and they sewed him up. He's okay now. We have learned at a terrible and a brutal cost that retreat does not bring safety and weakness does not bring peace. And it is this lesson that has brought us to Vietnam. 1965 marked the 10th anniversary of the United States involvement in the Vietnam War. When Lyndon Johnson assumed office in 1963, he became the third U.S. president to struggle with this conflict, both internationally and here at home. Throughout his presidency, he frequently had to address public concerns and confusion over our involvement in Southeast Asia. What are our goals in that war-stained land? First, we intend to convince the communists that we cannot be defeated by force of arms or by superior power. Second, once the communists know, as we know, that a violent solution is impossible, then a peaceful solution is inevitable. Johnson struggled to clearly define the Vietnam War and often used our two previous world wars and Korea as a basis for continued involvement. However, he failed to recognize that Vietnam was a very different war. Vietnam was a civil war whereas the previous wars, most notably World War I and World War II, were wars based on one country's domination over another. The war in Vietnam is not like these other wars. Yet, finally, war is always the same. It is young men dying in the fullness of their promise. Another unique aspect of this war in Southeast Asia was that our previous wars were won by a strategy of taking and occupying land until the enemy had no room to hide. But in Vietnam, we abandoned that strategy. To win the war, the whole idea was to kill the enemy and to do so by using overwhelming firepower and superior technology while continuing to engage them with a steady increase of soldiers. 
It was a war of attrition, and this strategy made Vietnam a very different war for America. Some would argue it made the war unwinnable. But in the midst of all of the technology and strategic confusion, one resource emerged proving itself to be invaluable in the field. Dogs. In particular, scout dogs. In Vietnam, dogs and handlers together braved countless dangers and are credited with saving over 10,000 American lives. The idea is for the uh, scout dog is to provide a silent alert. Even though they led the patrol, their job was to find the enemy before the enemy found them. In Vietnam, the jungles were deadly. Using their senses to see, smell, and hear dangers before they claimed American lives, dogs were often the difference between life and death. Separated only by a leash, handlers and dogs cared, shared, and looked out for each other. They were teammates. Handler and, and scout dog had an incredible bond. They shared just about everything there was except for his toothbrush. They get smart. After you teach them about explosive and you walk them into trip wires and, and it goes bang, they learn. And they learn by you too, about your feelings. And if you're scared, the dog's scared. The dog gets scared, you better be scared. But the problem was, most people had not heard of dogs in the military. Reactions among military members when they first heard of them being used ranged from amusement to... Bewilderment, because nobody had ever heard of it. I never heard of the program. So many people didn't know there were even dogs in Vietnam. Oh, it's, it's too hot for dogs. Despite the documented success of canine courage and valor from previous wars, the ability and tremendous value of canine operations remained largely unknown. In fact, much of the information about canine programs had been kept under wraps to avoid revealing our capabilities in the field to the enemy. It turns out that, that the Army, as does the uh, Air Force uh, and the Navy, employs uh, dogs in their uh, military work. The Air Force and the Navy use them primarily for sentry and security work. The Army had started out uh, a number of years before learning from the Brits about a tracker dog program. Tracker dogs pursued the enemy through the dense jungle. They also located lost soldiers and downed pilots. Water dogs were trained to smell enemy divers hidden beneath the surface of rivers and harbors. Scout dogs walked point in front of human patrols. They searched out enemy traps and ambushes. Scout dog teams in Vietnam probably had the most difficult mission of all. They were the forward element of any patrol going into combat, and as such would be the first ones to make contact with the enemy. For walking point, you were the front guy. Actually, the dog was number one, you were number two, and behind you, you had a member of the platoon doing what we call riding shotgun. He was supposed to be there to protect me. Uh, but to be perfectly honest, it was a dog. I tr loved him and I trusted him. The scout dog team operated anywhere from 100 to 150 uh, yards in advance of the advanced scouts. They were out there totally naked on their own, which meant that the only thing uh, as a scout dog handler that was going to save your life was that dog. The Army was extremely interested in the value of a program that would help them in the very difficult and changeable terrain in Vietnam. But it took more than just dogs. Courage and ability had to be at both ends of the leash. The handler had an important job as much as the dog. The dog could make the alert, but it was up to the handler to interpret his dog and what that dog was telling him. Where was the enemy? Was it a booby trap, a mine, a trip wire, a punji stick, that type of thing? It was not a job that most people would want to have, which I, I have always held the scout dog handlers in, in very high regard because of that. There was one other thing these volunteers hadn't heard about. Scout dogs and their handlers represented a new and unparalleled capability, a capability that quickly gained the attention of the enemy. When their presence began to hurt the North Vietnamese, they decided that they were going to take them out. Handlers and dogs entered the war with a bounty on their heads. 
With the Viacon finding the scout dog team so effective, they placed a bounty on them. The amount of the bounty varied what year it was in Vietnam, the location in Vietnam. The Viet Cong also knew that uh, there was not an endless supply of scout dog teams like there were infantrymen, and that's why they had put a high price on their heads. There was a bounty on our heads because if you could take out the scout dog team, uh, you took out their walking radar. When the NVA and the Viet Cong began to realize the effectiveness uh, of the scout dog teams, they would try to take uh, the team out, even if it meant uh, giving away an ambush position or giving away some kind of a, uh, uh, of a defensive position uh, that they were in, rather than uh, have uh, the unit the scout dog team was working with uh, get the jump on them. So th there were certainly occasions where uh, they came under uh, early fire. He number one target with that dog. One dog that uh, lasted 20 minutes, going down off the mountainside. They shot the dog and didn't, didn't shoot any American. So that goes to show you how good these dogs did their job. These guys had the toughest job that you can have. They walked point. These handlers and these dogs saved thousands of GIs from either death or being maimed. Described as a steadfast, unassuming young man who was very proud of family and his sense of place, Bob Hartsock grew up in a rural area of the Allegheny Mountains south of Everett, Pennsylvania. His dad, Kenneth, was a World War II veteran and owned a small farm where everyone in the family pitched in. Bob learned early on the value of hard work, commitment to family and friends, and the importance of teamwork, which was further developed through his love of sports, especially baseball. Bob always had a smile on his face. He was really outgoing and would do anything for you. And that's just the way he was. Your whole memory of Bob was always joyful. We grew up together on the farm, did a lot of farming together. He and I used to clean the barns out. One thing that I most vividly remember is him throwing a dead snake on me. Me screaming and yelling. <laughs> That's one of the most vivid childhood memories that I have. <laughs> Where I first met him was a little church. He was probably about 11 and I was probably about 13. I said, let's go smoke a cigarette. He said, I never smoked a cigarette before. So we walked up the road from the church and we lit it up. We had to pack a chewing gum. We thought that was going to save us. We was too dumb to know any different. We met probably in seventh grade and we had common interests. We both hunted and fished a lot. There wasn't a lot of entertainment in, in our area, so we spent a lot of time in the woods and, and on the streams. Bob was never satisfied unless he was outside. He loved it outside all the time. He was smart. You couldn't trick him in the woods. He was just a fun-loving kid. He liked playing ball. We played baseball in high school. Uh, he didn't play every inning of every game, but when he got in, he did well. And I never heard Bob complain that I should be playing or I should get more time. He was just the, uh, the consummate team player is probably the best way to describe Bob. Teamwork and a willing attitude to help others became synonymous for how people viewed Bob Hartsock. As for himself, he would later discover they were essential traits for leadership and even survival. During the rehearsal for our graduation, one of our advisors said, you people should cherish this time because it's the last time you're gonna be together as a class. And you know, when you're 18 years old, uh, bring on the world, you know, we're invincible. I have asked the commanding general, General Westmoreland, what more he needs to meet this mounting aggression. He has told me, and we will meet his needs. I have today ordered to Vietnam the Air Mobile Division, 
and certain other forces which will raise our fighting strength from 75,000 to 125,000 men almost immediately. Additional forces will be needed later, and they will be sent as requested. This will make it necessary to increase our active fighting forces by raising the monthly draft call from 17,000 over a period of time to 35,000. We were drafted uh, August 7, 1967, coming to Maryland. 19 of us from this area went together on the same buses to uh, Fairmont, West Virginia. Uh, the ones that passed went on to Clarksburg, and the ones that didn't pass the physical came back to Cumberland. Well, we were lucky, so we all got to go to uh, Clarksburg, and then they put us on an old two-propeller airplane and a real rattle trap and sent us to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and that's where we did our basic training. Bobby was a real good soldier. I mean, he was number one in uh, physical fitness, uh, just uh, the epitome of a real soldier. He could really move. Uh, if we'd have had track at our high school in those days, Bob would have probably been outstanding. He could really run and was really agile. He would doubt shoot us, do more push-ups than anybody. I first met Bob when I was assigned to the 44th Scout Dog Platoon in early July of 1968. As Bob Hartsock transitioned from a quiet country setting to being in the Army, he developed new friendships easily, such as with veterinary technician Lamar Smith. But no one would get to know him better than Roger Forbes. I almost can't talk about Bob Hartsock without talking about Roger because they were very close friends. They were inseparable. We both went to Fort Bragg. He was in one company, I was in another. For our next assignment, we got in the same company. Went to AIT, infantry. Bob and Roger graduated from advanced infantry training together, but they didn't receive any orders. Instead, they found themselves left behind as most of the other graduates headed for Germany. Everybody went to Germany, but 16 of us. We was holdovers, so we stayed like 11 weeks, and we uh, finally got orders. We didn't have to take them, but for Fort Benning, Georgia, to be scout dog handed. So nobody didn't know what a scout dog handler was until they said, well, well handling dogs are going to be uh, <clears throat> like the MP. So we went to dog school together. Like all enlisted handlers, they volunteered for scout dog school. Officers, on the other hand, were different. We graduated from OCS. We all got our orders on the same day. And there was another officer and myself who got orders for Scout Dog Training School. We didn't know what to expect, but when, when Carl and I both got orders for the infantry uh, platoon Scout Dog, uh, we looked at each other in, in, in complete bewilderment. Larry Hughes, a newly commissioned second lieutenant, learned about the scout dog program when he read his orders. At the time, he had no idea that his future and Bob Hartsock's were destined to come together a year later in a remote region of South Vietnam called Dao Tang. All he knew was he had no idea where he was going, much less what he would be doing the next day. When he got to Fort Benning, it was just... Uh, training that you wouldn't believe with these dogs. You didn't know how, uh, I guess how you say, uh, smart a dog can get. When you went in, you were stripped of rank, uh, treated just like anybody else uh, in the program. You were given uh, your own German Shepherd uh, within the first several days, and you went through the same training uh, as uh, all the men did who were going to be serving uh, in the scout dog platoons in Vietnam. Hi Rita and all. I guess you thought I wasn't going to write, but I have been pretty busy. We haven't done much but get our things put away and draw our equipment. 
We had seven classes yesterday on safety and care and equipment. It sounded better than what it will be, I believe. We have to spend 10 weeks out in the field and they let us come in once in a while to shower and clean up and for passes on the weekend, if we get any. <laughs> they said we'll sleep in tents and eat sea rations. Sounds real good, huh? Well, it's about time to fall out, so we'll write more when I have time. A dog and a person just don't bond. Once you get your dog, you can pet him and tell him to sit and down and things like that, and he'll do it. And then all of a sudden, the dog ain't doing it because you told him to, and he's doing it because he wants to. I love dogs, uh, and I had, uh, I had a great German Shepherd but as is always the case with non-commissioned officers and particularly young second lieutenants, they tend to give you the biggest, nastiest uh, German shepherds that uh, they have in the compound. And uh, uh, my dog was, uh, was over 100 pounds and was a beast. Uh, but we got along great. Uh, it was a great training program. I loved it. One of the most important lessons taught at the school is that your dog's care is critical. Handlers took this responsibility seriously and relied heavily on veterinary technicians and veterinarians. The military came to our school and says, you know, there's a war going on. And they showed us pictures of Vietnam. And uh, you guys can practice this profession in the Army. And if you don't sign up in the military, we're going to draft you into the infantry. So just about all the men went up and signed up. Scout dog training lasted 12 weeks and was one of the longest schools in the Army. A lot can happen in 12 weeks. As Bob, Roger, and others were concentrating on learning skills with their dogs that would one day save lives, a turning point in the war occurred. Tet, a term that's synonymous with the Vietnam War. Over the years, the, the Tet lunar cycle, the new year, had been recognized uh, on both sides of the conflict as kind of a, a break, a rest period, a two or three day ceasefire. The Vietnamese, whether the North or South Vietnamese, uh, believe very strongly uh, in, their, in their festivals and, and uh, their various uh, holidays. That is a celebration of the Lunar New Year and is the most important holiday on the Vietnamese calendar. In previous years, the holiday served as an informal truce in the war. But in 1968, the North Vietnamese chose the start of their new year as the occasion for a massive and well-coordinated offensive aimed at breaking the stalemate in Vietnam. In this particular case, there were rumors uh, that there was um, a lot of NVA, North Vietnamese Army, activity uh, around major cities uh, in South Vietnam. There, there was nothing concrete, uh, but there were rumors, and there were rumors that, uh, that were being uh, given credence in uh, tactical uh, decision-making. Nobody uh, was prepared for the fact that we now know from, from the in-country history that some 80,000 enemy combatants would be coordinated uh, in an attack uh, that uh, began uh, shortly after the Tet. In the early morning hours of January 30th, 1968, the North Vietnamese attacked more than 100 cities and outposts throughout South Vietnam. It was an attempt to foment rebellion among the South Vietnamese population and encourage the United States to scale back its involvement in the war. And it, of course, has become known as the, uh, as the Great Tet Offensive, but this was a supremely well-coordinated attack. If I remember right, uh, uh, there were something uh, like 100, 120 cities uh, that were involved in the Tet Offensive. Uh, 
I do believe every provincial headquarters in South Vietnam came under attack. News coverage of this massive offensive, gained from unprecedented access to the battlefield, shocked the American public. They watched on TV pitched battles and knew we weren't winning the war, even though Johnson's administration had been claiming that the end of the war was in sight. Now it was clear that a long struggle lay ahead as 200,000 new troops were requested in order to mount an effective counteroffensive. To say that we are closer to victory today is to believe, in the face of the evidence, the optimists who have been wrong in the past. To suggest we are on the edge of defeat is to yield to unreasonable pessimism. To say that we are mired in stalemate seems the only realistic, if unsatisfactory, conclusion. This escalation was seen by many as an act of desperation and ultimately ensured Bob Hartsock and his fellow handlers had jobs waiting for them in Southeast Asia. After Bennings, you went to Vietnam. No ifs, ands, and buts. Well, just left Okinawa. It'll take about three and a half more hours to get to Ben Hoa. That's about 15 miles north of Saigon. Roger and I got separated and put into separate groups in California, but we will all arrive over here at the same place. He's supposed to leave California around 5.30 Wednesday evening. There's four dog handlers and one vet with us. Well, not much else is new, so take care and write. Love, Bob. We was in a, uh, it was a big one, a 707 or something like that, but it was branded. And it had like 300 people on it. And you rode, I think it took us 17 and a half hours or something like that. We stopped in Guam, and then we went over to I'd like to welcome you aboard Braniff International Vietnam. Airways. A friendly greeting awaits you when you enter a plane of Braniff International Airways for your trip. I'm circling in an airplane at Benoit. Two crippled jets come in that had been flying, I guess, over North Vietnam. Then we landed in Benoit. I was assigned to the 25th Infantry Division, known as Tropic Lightning, based out of Kuchi. This is Kuchi, home of the 25th Infantry, the Tropic Lightning Boys. This is a new base for us and a new base for them, too. They just fought the Kong for this landscape about six months ago. We shared our Christmas dinner with Company A of the 1st Battalion. The luscious gal in the now famous miniskirt is the voice of Armed Forces Radio, Chris Noel, the round-eyed Hanoi Hannah. 20 minutes after we finished dinner, these kids were out on patrol a few hundred yards away. Two VC were killed, one escaped. Hi Rita and all. I guess you thought Charlie had got me because I haven't written. The Bob Hope Show was at Coochie yesterday. It's the headquarters of the 25th Division. It is hot and humid here, about 100 degrees and no wind. While we were in the bleachers this morning, there was some incoming mortars. They've had a lot of action around here lately. They have big guns and mortars all around the perimeter of the base. And when I first got here, every time one went off, I jumped. About an hour ago, some B-52 bombers dropped some bombs about 10 miles north of here. It felt like an earthquake. Me and Roger got sent to the same outfit. He's with me here at the replacement center. Tell everyone I said hi. I'll write when I get time. Don't tell mom anything to worry her. Bob. We was a replacement package. So we went over and we got dogs that was already there. You had to um, get with your dog. And after a while, you just, your dog knew that you was a handler. Most dogs didn't switch over very well. And you, uh, lots of times when the dog handler would get hit and the dog didn't, they had to kill the dog to get. We had a team out today, a dog and a handler, and they walked so fast that the dog got sick and finally took a fit. They called in a dust off, a medical chopper. When you get a medevac call, the first thing you did was tighten up. Everybody sat up in their seat said, okay, this is where the action starts. We got there, we saw the LZ, they threw smoke so that we could get a reading on the actual place they wanted us to land. And immediately after we landed, a dog was being carried by its handler to the aircraft. 
Uh, he boarded the aircraft, asked us to get it right to go to brigade and get to the veterinary clinic. And they brought him in. We put water on him and gave him artificial respiration, but the dog died. He'd been over here for a year and a half. And all evening, the guys were sad as if one of the guys had gotten shot. When your dog went down, uh, it, was a, it was a great personal loss. And, and very often, it would mean that, uh, that the dog uh, handler would have to be rotated back uh, to Coochie to the in-country operational training center for all the scout dog platoons and scout dogs in country uh, and pick up a new dog. And that was very difficult. While the loss of a dog was felt by the handler, the bond went both ways and the dogs experienced grief too, often profound. And at times even death couldn't break it. it had a great bond. That's why you couldn't get near some dogs except the handler could. It's such a, an individual thing and they have such a camaraderie that uh, dogs are never right after they lose their master. We unfortunately lost a handler uh, early on and we did not lose the dog uh, physically, but we totally lost the dog from the standpoint of being able to perform scout dog duties. He would not work any longer. He watched his handler die. It was this bond that made the scout dog team so effective. It epitomized how they worked together. One of the things when you're in a combat theater that you learn is that you have to depend on each other. And the teamwork that was built in Vietnam, uh, you depended on your buddies and they depended on you. Dog handlers are part of a unique fraternity. It was a job unlike any other in the military. The teamwork between the dog and the handler was crucial for their survival. But they also relied on friendships with other handlers. The solitary life of the field took its toll, and it was a camaraderie with fellow handlers that helped them to survive. Bob Hartsock and another sergeant, Roger Forbes, hung out together a lot. They were both very good and effective sergeants. I first met Bob when I was assigned to the 44th Scout Dog Platoon in early July of 1968. Now, I am, was born and raised in Alabama, so you would think that I would have been a country music aficionado at the time, but I was not. I was a, a 60s rock and roll guy, but Roger and um, Bob introduced me to country music, specifically Charlie Pride and a few other uh, singers. And we listened to country music, and we drank beer, and we played double deck pinochle. He and he and Roger generally were a team, not to be trifled with. Today, another guy's dog got loose and went over to Duke. They were okay until he went up to get his dog. Duke wanted to play, and the other dog got jealous. They got into it, but Duke got the best of him. He had a couple cuts, but nothing serious. I told everybody they better keep their dogs away because he was a killer. First guy I see is Sergeant Hartsock. So he sees me, walks up, Captain, how are you? I'm Sergeant Hartsock. I says, Sergeant, I says, I'm a veterinarian for us. I just happen to be a captain. From here on out, I want everybody calling me Doc and don't salute me. So he's looking at me and saying, Captain, what's that in your mouth? I says, that's red man tobacco. I chew tobacco. He said, oh my God, I haven't had that in ages. I love it. I reached in my pocket and I had a pack and I gave it to him. My sister lived in Ohio and she used to send me a little bit and it was produced in Toledo. I think two little old ladies owned it. So I said, my sister, give me the address. I sent a letter back then. They sent us a gross, 144 packages at no charge. God bless you. Come home safely. So every time I'd go to base camp, I would give him tobacco. He was the nicest guy. We'd sit down and shoot the breeze, have a beer. Looking forward to enjoying simple pleasures from home made it bearable to go back out in the field. During my time there, they would uh, say, okay, B Company 2nd 506 needs a scout dog. And so they would load two handlers and two dogs on a deuce and a half truck and, and take us over to the helipad. We would get on the chopper and they would take us out to the field. And 
Normally, we might be relieving another set of scout dog teams because you'd only usually work for five days and the dog was disinterested, and so you would just rotate and fresh teams in. It'd take you out seven days with a different outfit, chopper you out, and then bring you back, not for you, for the dog, because uh, it would take, uh, I mean, Rocket weighed like uh, 18 pounds, um, 118, 115 pounds. He's a big golden shepherd. And in seven days, water and stuff like that, he'd weigh like 90 pounds. He'd lose like 20 pounds almost. And it'd take him three weeks to get built back up. Because once a dog is very smart and stuff like that, but once he gets tired, he's just like anybody else. He lets things slip. And when he lets things slip, and you walk into night ambushes and just all kinds of stuff. So it was to let the dogs rest, not you. It was a dog. I tr loved him and I trusted him, but he could be having a bad day. So I, I kind of kept one eye on him and one eye on the, the trail for myself. Because if he missed something and I caught it, that would be great. But if we both missed it, it could be fun. When the scout dog team would be deployed to the field, the handler was the one responsible for carrying everything for both of them. And this would be upwards of 90 pounds of equipment. Besides the food for the handler, he carried the food and water for the dog as well, along with his rifle and ammunition. I've been out in the field and I'm going out again for three days. I come in yesterday afternoon. Duke works good in the field. I'm really satisfied with him. We didn't have much action. After today, everyone will be in the field or gone somewhere. We carried uh, what we call an Alice pack. And I carried uh, so much dog food, a couple cans of dog food. And uh, if they had a dog, they had to resupply the dog. But if you had a hot meal, the dog got the same thing that I did. A hot meal. One time on the trail, we're sitting there taking a break and going to eat our sea rations, and that dog looking at me with those big brown eyes, and I got the wieners and beans can. And I said, okay, buddy, you take care of me, I'll take care of you. He got the wieners, I got the beans. Teamwork in combat goes far beyond simply caring for the dog and the dog obeying the handler. The dog had to remain alert and attentive, and the handler had to understand what the dog was trying to communicate. The dog could make the alert, but it was up to the handler to interpret his dog and what that dog was telling him. Where was the enemy? Was it a booby trap, a mine, a tripwire? And depending on whether he caught an airborne scent or saw something or heard something, it was my job to read his body language and say, wait a second, Rebel see something. You had to learn your dog and watch your wind. Like at nighttime, sit on top of a hill, and if you had something on the left side of you, just sitting there, the dog would just kind of go, just look, and then he'd come back. And then 30 seconds later, he'd come back and look. The dog sitting down, going like this, so they looked at trees, they picked off a sniper at one of the palm trees. That's why they kept us on night bambush, because they uh, would give you an early silent warning. And you'd say, boys, here they come, because every other guy would be sleeping. And have your claymores and everything. And then when it all broke loose, my job wasn't to fight. My job was to get my dog down. The very first time I was in the field, we're walking, and I'm not even the lead dog on this one. I'm, I'm that second dog team way back in the thing. Also, my dog goes, whoop. I say, wait, whoa, it was a bunker. There's no doubt that, that, the, that the men that the scout dog team was protecting were uh, incredibly uh, appreciative for the most part of the role that they played. And I think sometimes uh, because everybody for the most part, loved the, the dogs, that which were primarily German Shepherds, there would be an, a, an attempt to be friendly with them uh, or, uh, or to 
uh, try to befriend uh, uh, the handler uh, and his dog. Uh, but we, we discourage that and, and, and very often uh, the team themselves would, would try to remain uh, isolated so as to uh, uh, not reduce the effectiveness uh, of the dog. Unfortunately, because they walked point, some commanders didn't use them properly and used them nothing more than someone that nobody else knew. So if they got hit, the platoon didn't take it quite as badly as they would if one of their own did. Our luck hasn't been very good. In the last 16 days, we've had two killed, three wounded and sent to Japan, and two wounded and on light duty here. It really lowers everyone's morale. It's changed everyone in the platoon, I think. I know things don't seem the same to me. We got a new CO, he, he seems like he's okay. Maybe he'll stick up for us and get rid of some of our you-know-what details. When I got there, there had been some uh, casualties. There was some shuffling around of platoon commanders for the Scout Dog program in Vietnam. And I ended up uh, being sent to the 44th IPSD at Dao Tieng. I would go into the field uh, when I received complaints from my uh, handlers uh, about misuse or uh, misconceptions at the platoon or company level of how to utilize uh, the, the scout dog uh, teams. It was an ongoing problem all over in country, but what would happen in the field occasionally would be that, that uh, a unit commander uh, sensing that, that uh, this team uh, could be utilized effectively sometimes at the expense of, uh, of his own men uh, would try to order them into a, a situation where they were searching out tunnels uh, or whether they or, or, or where they were being asked to provide some kind of sentry dog duty and that's not what they were there for. And the dog team itself was really the unit. I was with a whole platoon of strangers. I didn't know any of them. The only thing I knew was me and Rebel together. We've been having a lot of commitments lately. Another infantry unit moved in the day before yesterday and called for five dog teams plus the five we already had out. So here I am on guard again. <laughs> While handlers and dogs walked alone in front of the units they served, one element of support was never a concern, medical care. Dogs were a priority and helicopters provided house calls to the field. I had a dog that was injured in the field, uh, actually suffering from heat exhaustion more than anything else. I think some lesions uh, on his legs and they choppered me out. And uh, I just took care of what I needed to take care of and they choppered me back in. If you got in a firefight and you had GIs there wounded, you had a dog wounded, and you had uh, Arvin wounded, and you had a gook wounded. Okay, a dust off would come in, GIs would go, dog would go, and then people. For a while we didn't have much to do, but now things are pretty well stirred up. One battalion moved out and we're short on help now. We're having to pull perimeter guard on two bunkers. It's not too bad. We have three men for all night and only pull three hours each. We had a mortar attack yesterday. We got about 40 or 50 rounds in altogether. About 20 of them hit in our area. One hit outside the orderly room and showered it with shrapnel. We got a direct hit on our hooch. It really tore things up. I took some pictures of it. One round hit the kennels, but there wasn't any dogs in it. They were tied outside to the trees. Nine of them got shrapnel wounds. I'm been doubting base camp. Uh... I get a call that a bunch of them been wounded. So I, I called our colonel. I said, you got to get these dogs transported down to my base camp. So they did. It, it only took a few hours. And thank God, none of the wounds were fatal at all. But I had very few equipment. So I get on the phone to the division. So you got to send some of your doctors. I, I, it's like a mass unit. They sent some doctors out. And 
compared to human medicine where they have gas inhalation and anesthesia. I had to strap pentobarbital and a syringe to the veins and keep titrating it to keep them down. We prepped the wounds and they would do the surgery. They brought their own surgical pad, but MASH doctors actually working on wounded war dog. All the dogs recovered. They ended up back at their main base camp. Duke got a small piece behind his ear and we took him to Kuchi to the division vet and they sewed them up. Richard Nixon's election in November of 1968 marked another turning point in the Vietnam War. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I didn't realize so many of you would stay up so late. <laughs> Plus, the approaching holidays provided some needed rest and relief for the men and dogs of the 44th. We've been off for five days. Our CO got all the dogs put on medical hold over Christmas. We had chicken, hamburgers, and weenies enough for 20 people for three days. We also had some macaroni salad and 24 quarts of eggnog. For three days, the beer and whiskey was free from our club, so we had a pretty good time. I'd have liked to have been home, though. Every base camp during the Christmas season, we had a Christmas party. Food, beer, we'd all talk, laugh, play music, and, uh, you know, the music of the 60s. And uh, it was just, it was a common bond friendship. Nixon's inauguration was the calm before the storm. Each moment in history is a fleeting time, precious and unique. But some stand out as moments of beginning, in which courses are set that shape decades or centuries. This can be such a moment. I'm going to have another picture made with me and Duke both on payday. There isn't much new going on over here. It's still hot and dry. I really like it now. I'm up for staff sergeant next month, which will be really good. I won't have to do anything then. <laughs> it's almost like that now. As the lull in action in the field continued, complacency began to be the new enemy. It was easy to overlook the threat when you weren't searching for the enemy. What most American commanders did not realize, or perhaps they didn't look for it, was this was part of a larger strategy that would be known as Tet-69, another offensive by the North Vietnamese that would be every bit as large as last year's, but far more deceptive in its strategy. Dal Chang is in a position here next to the Saigon River. It comprises five hamlets. We have here a population of about 10,000 people which is approximately two-thirds of the total population here in the Freetown district. Because of our position next to the village, we feel that uh, we can get in here and do civic action work with the people and thereby reach most of the people in the district. At the heart of what made the North Vietnamese unpredictable, was that most analysts missed one simple fact about this war. This was a civil war. So when American forces entered an area with civic action programs intended to help, we wound up dividing the people between North and South ideologies as we saw them, and for the most part, ignored the real issues affecting a common population. Dividing people resulted in giving them a common enemy. U.S. troops. I just got back from R&R &R and thought I'd write a few lines. How's everything over there? Okay, I hope. Lots of mountains. We had a fairly large uh, civilian village outside the gates of Dao Tiang. This, this whole area uh, was part of the old Michelin rubber tree plantation holdings. And in fact, Dao Tiang, the base camp, uh, was, was part of where the Michelin uh, headquarters had been. Most of these campsites, they would come in and out of the gate. They would, they would be performing uh, some limited services. While continuing their combat operations, the 25th Infantry Division, 
began putting more emphasis upon psychological warfare and pacification programs. The army controlled the area and the villages and the interactions with the civilians during the day and the night belonged to uh, Charlie uh, and the NVA. Willing cooperation and the enthusiasm shown by the people here in Daoqing is a good indication that these people feel secure from D.C. Uh, in the area here, that uh, they want to see their village progress, that, I, that uh, it, we have come a long way in the, the time that the brigade has been here and has assisted these people. And I think that uh, in time to come, we're going to find these people contributing more and also feeling more secure. Of course, what we came to find out afterwards is that the, the NVA and the Viet Cong were very successful at employing them in terms of developing intelligence and what the layout of a camp was, where various assets were within that camp, what the vulnerabilities were, the force strength, that kind of thing. What we also didn't know is, like Kuchi, they had been tunneling for years from the surrounding countryside uh, to the point where there were a number of tunnels that ran underneath uh, our security, our wire, our watchtowers, and so forth. The North Vietnamese, in conjunction with the citizens of Dao Tiang, did a masterful job of deception. It wasn't until they were ready to launch their attack that we had any indication something was amiss. And even then, we had no idea of the scale of the attack that was to come. Hi, Mom and Dad. I guess you thought I'd forgot about you because I haven't written, but I've been busy lately. For a while, we didn't have much to do, but now things are pretty well stirred up. I've got Sergeant of the Guard again tonight, so I better go check them. Take care and write, and I'll write more later. In the dark and early hours of Sunday, February 23, 1969, Dao Tiang erupted. The base was under an unexpected and brutal assault by two North Vietnamese Army divisions, and Bob Hartsock, along with his platoon commander, Larry Hughes, was in the middle of it. What started out uh, as an ordinary uh, evening suddenly erupted. There was a lot of sporadic gunfire uh, that started. Uh, there were some attempts as a diversionary tactic to breach the outside wire and, and uh, get through the minefield. I was on the second bunker over from the main gate, in the village of Dao Chiang, which was right out in front of the bunker where I was. There were a few reports actually from one of the bunkers that we were guarding uh, early in the evening of some unusual activity in the village. I had seen flashlights in the village and had reported that via radio. It was about 11 o'clock at night and a lot of movement. Things have been kind of hairy that night. Bob Hartsock was the sergeant of the guard. He and Roger Forbes had driven down to the perimeter, to the bunkers. We jumped in the Jeep and went down. We went the back way, around the back side of the woods. Um, Bob obviously performing his duty as sergeant of the guard that night. So we got to the second bunker. By the time we got there, all hell broke loose. Roger and Bob were on top of the bunker with me when a rocket came in behind us and hit uh, a, a building that housed civilians it was inside the base camp. We turned around when that rocket exploded and we could see the NVA running down the road that led up to that bunker. The enemy had, had broken into the base camp. Uh, I, I, some people would call it one thing, I call it we were overrun. Because just that quickly, there were, there were enemy inside the wire. The nearly 20,000 enemy soldiers was the largest force that had been seen in the area for nearly five years. And it was raging unstoppably through the base, 
spearheaded on multiple fronts by fast, well-coordinated squads of elite NBA soldiers. Bob said, stay here and take over. He was going to go back to Dog Batoon and get some reinforcing. He came flying back to our platoon area and we quickly organized a perimeter security for the platoon area because we, uh, we knew just from the sound of the attack uh, that the scout dogs would be a very inviting and vital uh, target. Everybody who was not on the perimeter was placed around the scout dog uh, platoon area and everybody else was engaged in trying to figure out what the heck was going on. From, from my standpoint, the, the battle continued to rage. Uh, I, I was taking almost no small arms fire from in front of the bunker that I was on. Most of the small arms fire that we were taking came from behind us. There were definitely uh, snipers actually got into the building that was behind our bunker, 60, 70 yards behind our bunker. And we were taking fire from there throughout the night. We then threw together as much ammunition and supplies as uh, we could uh, in our unit jeep and headed back uh, to the bunker lines. And he come back and Lieutenant Hughes and him left to go get more people. And so we jumped in a jeep and we started uh, toward our sector. Well, they cut through the middle of the main, what's call it? And lo and behold, through one of these tunnels, a sapper squad had emerged and they were fairly uh, easy to detect as being sapper squads because usually one or more of the, uh, the uh, guys would be laden with these, these bags strapped uh, around them or they'd be carrying them. And these, these were, they looked like uh, these messenger bags uh, that you see bike messengers carrying, except that they were full of explosives and they had a short fuse and they would literally light the fuse and then fling the handle uh, in the direction uh, that, they, that they wanted the detonation to take place. So we saw this uh, sapper squad and we knew pretty much immediately uh, what it was and from the direction that they were heading, we were uh, positive that they were heading for uh, our tactical operations center, which also was where the prisoner uh, compound uh, was located. If the sapper squad could get to the prisoner compound a few hundred yards away, that meant there would be hundreds more enemy combatants suddenly fighting the Americans from within their own base. The fall of the Tactical Operations Center into enemy hands would guarantee the loss of the base to the North Vietnamese. And with the base completely surrounded, there'd be no escape for the American soldiers or the dogs. Their choice of action was clear. They had to stop them. We took uh, the best defensive cover position we could, which was uh, in a drainage ditch. So we started suppressing fire to, to try to uh, eliminate them or, or at least uh, detain them until we, we could get some help ourselves. Battle hardened by over 14 years of war in Southeast Asia, the North Vietnamese could not have worried about an easy-going country boy from the Allegheny Mountains of Western Maryland and Southern Pennsylvania. They did not initially see us. They halted probably a good 75 feet away from us and they sent out a, a flank person who had a, a weapon and a, and a satchel charge with him. He was within 20, 25 feet of our location. He was wounded, but it was clear that the satchel charge uh, was going to detonate. 40 pounds of C4 goes off in a ditch and you're 20 yards from it. You won't hardly find your teeth. Completely cut off and isolated by an overwhelming enemy force, unable to warn his fellow handlers, unable to even get his canine partner Duke, Bob Hartsock only had one thing left with which to fight an enemy of this magnitude, his life.
without any regard for his own personal situation, uh, Bob got up and threw himself on the satchel charge, absorbing the blast. He was gravely wounded. At that point, the rest of the NBA squad was alerted to the situation uh, and our presence. In spite of his wounds, Sergeant Hartsock crawled about five meters to a ditch and provided heavy suppressive fire, completely pinning down the enemy. At that point, I was able to get away uh, toward the Tactical Operations Center and uh, alert them uh, as to what was going on. And they were able to uh, get reinforcements and, and, and secure the area. Sergeant Hartsock made sure Lieutenant Hughes was able to get away, ultimately thwarting the North Vietnamese attack on Dao Tang. It was one of those nights where the muscle memory of your training and your instinctual uh, uh, abilities uh, take over. John Stuart Mill said, war is an ugly thing, but not the ugliest of things. A man who has nothing which he cares about more than his personal safety is a miserable creature and has no chance of being free unless made and kept so by the exertions of better men than himself. If you're talking about character and you're talking about uh, somebody who uh, was always very serious about uh, his duties and his comportment and his demeanor, uh, that was Sergeant Hartsock, and certainly, uh, as is self-evident, what he did was uh, well above and beyond the call of duty and was exceptional. Staff Sergeant Hartsock's tremendous sacrifice to save others, while tragic, didn't surprise the people who knew him best. They had seen this trait in Bob before. Still, his friends at Dao Tiang grieved his loss. Steadfast, unassuming uh, young man who was uh, very proud of family and his sense of place. Bravest man I ever met. He gave his shirt off his back. He's just, just a great guy. That's a. Uh... A good friend. I always thought Bob would be the one that would make it back. But grief wasn't reserved for just his human friends. His canine partner, Duke, grieved as well. His handler had always cared for him, no matter what. When there was action, they went out to face it, and they always came back, together. Except this night. They had been separated, and Duke couldn't get to his handler. Now. His closest friend was gone forever, and he knew it. I've never been as afraid in my life as, as I was that night. I, I say that quite sincerely. I was very afraid. Uh, and I thought to myself, the sun will come up and they'll go away. And then again, the sun came up, and damn it, they didn't go away. Though physically fit and uninjured, their bond had been tragically and without warning broken. Despite Lamar Smith's best efforts caring for Duke, he refused to eat or even drink. He quietly passed away a short time later having succumbed to a self-imposed starvation. Perhaps it was his way of following his handler on one last mission. You're the good guy.
Mr. Secretary, General S. Marlin, all of our distinguished guests on this occasion. This ceremony today is one that means a great deal to this White House, which has seen, as you can imagine, in its long history, some very special occasions. This House has honored many men and many women. I have often thought, as I look back on the period that I have participated in such occasions, and I did so for eight years as vice president, and so now for a year and a half as president, that no men deserve honor more than those we honor today. When we think of what these young men did, how much they gave, we realize that no king or emperor or prime minister or president could deserve the honor of this house, the first house in America, than they do. Because of what they did, because they gave their lives, other men are alive today. The citations will be read by the Secretary of Army, and they will tell us better than any words I could utter what these men have done beyond the call of duty. I would like to add just a personal word, a word that I think all of the American people would join me in. Uh, we really cannot honor these men, but they have honored America. They have added to the honor of the nation by what they have done. They share several things in common. They are men who risk their lives for their fellow men. They are men who face death, and instead of losing their courage, they gave courage to the men around them. We will proceed now with the ceremony, and uh, after the ceremony is concluded, uh, Mrs. Nixon would like to invite all of the members of the family and those senators and congressmen who can work it into their schedules to uh, a reception in the state dining room so that you can have the opportunity not only to see the room, but enjoy some of the better pastries that are prepared by the White House chef. Secretary of the Army will read the first citation. The President of the United States of America, authorized by Act of Congress March 3, 1863, has posthumously awarded in the name of the Congress the Medal of Honor to the following individuals for conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity in action at the cost of their lives above and beyond the call of duty. From the United States Army, Staff Sergeant Robert W. Hartsock, while serving as section leader with the 44th Infantry Platoon, 3rd Brigade, 25th Infantry Division in Hao Nia Province, Republic of Vietnam on February 23, 1969. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that completes the ceremony, and I would only add this uh, word. We express on behalf of this nation our appreciation for the men who gave their lives. We also express appreciation to the parents, parents who helped to give these men their heritage, and to the wives and members of the family who helped them along the way. Thank you very much.